Good afternoon, viewers. I am Shankar Kumar. I teach history at Hindu College in uh, University of Delhi, and welcome to this series of lectures on European history. Uh, the uh, specific topic that we are talking about today uh, is the Enlightenment, uh, and uh, we are not uh, touching upon the uh, theoretical part of the specific uh, Enlightenment authors, the iconic ones, uh, but. we are undertaking uh, uh, an exercise which is trying to track the movement of these ideas or reception of these ideas across time and space in history uh, because these ideas are supposed to have uh, enveloped uh, the world altogether it it spread to different areas Uh, but uh, should we understand it as some kind of a spread from one center, or should we understand it as some kind of a dynamic, uh, uh, you can say, dynamic interaction as a consequence of which these ideas kept uh, getting redefined, retold, uh, and uh, several other meanings uh, got uh, uh, got uh, added to it. and that is how these uh, notions uh, uh, survived and traveled uh, or were manufactured so uh, if today uh, we all think that the ideas like liberty individualism nationality republicanism uh, citizenship etc are Uh, still current uh, in the vocabulary of politics and economy and society well uh, we need to pause and think that uh, do they convey the meaning which these iconic big enlightenment thinkers had spoken about or over a period of time as it happens with any other cultural uh, uh, product right uh, as it travels across time and space it gains and uh, loses several meanings and uh, it is as a consequence of this that whatever we understand in 21st century today by these words by these ideas so the emphasis is not on the uh, pristine pure articulations made by these enlightenment thinkers but on the dynamics of the travel of these ideas uh, at different points of time in history in different regions in different uh, uh, say in japan in in uh, southeast asia in india uh, in china uh, in latin america so they may convey uh, something else and it is the conjunctures that is coming together of various tangents at a particular point of time at a particular place that uh, is more instrumental in giving a particular meaning to these ideas so that is the pith and substance of uh, the alternate perspective uh, which tends to take the meaning or understanding of the enlightenment from its conventional mold to the alternative global history mold or global history perspective so this uh, earlier i have spoken to you about the conventional portrayal of uh, the enlightenment uh, and in this uh, interaction we are more concerned with the alternative global history perspective that has emerged over the last uh, 30 years or so Uh, in the in the writings of uh, various uh, uh, intellectual historians now uh, it it is the uh, i mean you have a range of uh, uh, scholars who have worked on this the uh, the bibliography of this alternative perspective is uh, is also quite voluminous now uh, so uh, Uh, Sanjay Subramaniam is also writing about uh, the connected histories, and uh, you can uh, uh, you can get uh, a different kind of flavor of uh, the Enlightenment ideas when you view uh, 
uh, this phenomena from uh, the perspective of uh, Sanjay Subramanian. So, uh, you have a range of scholars whose, uh, whose writings uh, can uh, be clubbed uh, in this alternative global history perspective. Uh, but just to, uh, just to track that, uh, I do not know whether uh, in this brief in interaction of 20-25 minutes it would be possible to uh, run through uh, the bibliography of this. So, I am not going to do that. I am just going to talk about the salient features of this alternative global history perspective which uh, constitutes uh, uh, the, the uh, contours of uh, uh, the uh, writings, historiography uh, around, uh, around uh, the enlightenment. So, uh, this alternative global history perspective uh, uh, of course is recent, but the departure from the conventional portrayal, the original questioning of the conventional portrayal, con conventional mold in which uh, the uh, West was uh, supposed to be uh, the place where it emerged, these uh, enlightenment ideas emerged and subsequently diffused to different parts of the world. This kind of portrayal was for the first time, uh, you can say, uh, questioned. Uh, very early uh, in, in Immanuel Kant's uh, 1784 uh, essay, uh, an answer to the question, what is enlightenment? And ever since, ever since, so as you can see uh, in the uh, last quarter of the 18th century itself, people had started questioning uh, uh, the, the uh, conventional understanding of, uh, of uh, uh, enlightened scholars. And ever since, this trend had, uh, has continued and uh, as I said that uh, if you look at the recent spate of writings around uh, uh, the enlightenment, you get this global uh, uh, history perspective. Now, uh, the tenability of the conventional historiography gets challenged in the global history perspective uh, of the enlightenment on three grounds and they are all listed on your slide as you can see. Uh, the first ground that one can identify uh, with respect to which the conventional portrayal is critiqued is the fact that enlightenment as conventionally understood as sovereign and autonomous accomplishment of European intellectuals alone is something that gets questioned in favor of enlightenment ideas having many authors in many places. So, there is a sense of shift from singularity and exclusiveness of enlightenment ideas in favor of plurality and plurality of places. So, these ideas uh, uh, were not the sovereign and autonomous accomplishment of Western Europe and Western Europe alone. Rather, in a very dynamic way, whoever uh, engaged with these ideas had their own contribution to, uh, to, to, to contribute to uh, these ideas and at times these ideas were used uh, in a very instrumental way. Uh, depending on the conjuncture, depending on the specific time and space that we are talking about. So, it could be at some moment in the 19th century Japanese history, it could be some other moment in the 19th century socio-religious uh, movement uh, in India as part of uh, uh, the efforts made by Rajaram Mohan Rai and so forth, that these ideas were used, of course people were talking about it and so forth. but. Uh, they fine-tuned it, they accorded uh, a different meaning uh, to these ideas in the process. So, uh, the people who are supposedly using these ideas are not the passive recipients of these ideas. They accorded a new meaning and substance to these ideas and it is in that form that, it, uh, that most of us uh, in India consume it. Most of us in India understand about these ideas. So, there is nothing inherently uh, good and grand about uh, those ideas uh, as they appeared in the writings of enlightened scholars uh, in proportion 
of its bigness as we understand it today. Right. So I'll, I'll explain this uh, with reference to several examples. Let me run through uh, these uh, these grounds, these three grounds. So that's the first ground. Second ground on which this critique uh, is, is made uh, by the global uh, history perspective of enlightenment is that instead of Europe bound reason and reason is the centerpiece of uh, modernity. It's the centerpiece of uh, enlightenment uh, uh, writings as well. Uh, uh, it is a centerpiece of the sequel that I had earlier spoken of in the first part of this lecture from Renaissance, Humanism, Reformation, uh, Scientific Revolution to Enlightenment. So, reason is the centerpiece uh, of, of all these and uh, uh, the conventional uh, historiography uh, tends to put this reason uh, as emanating from Europe. Uh, and diffusing to different parts of the globe as progress. So, what we understand as progress uh, in, in uh, definitional terms is very Eurocentric. And uh, um, the global history perspective tends to move away from this. It tends to treat enlightenment ideas uh, uh, as a response to cross-border interaction and global integration. So, what is meant here is that uh, you will discover that if, if, you, if you look at the uh, political, economic, commercial uh, and social history of, uh, uh, of uh, the globe, you will also find that alongside enlightenment, there are several other things happening. Uh, the same western powers who are uh, regarded as the birthplace of these ideas are also fast emerging as the imperial powers. They are colonizing different parts of the globe, right? And in this process of uh, colonization, they are uh, using these ideas. They are uh, using these ideas to uh, to uh, to uh, or in the form of. Uh, or and as an alibi of progress, right? So uh, the the element of uh, progress uh, that uh, is spoken of or that gets intrinsically linked to the Enlightenment ideas is not on account of some inherent charm or inherent power in these uh, writings, but on account of the fact that they are imperial powers increasingly trying to. Uh, uh, suppress, uh, win, uh, uh, vanquish uh, other parts of the globe and trying to bring them under control. So, there is something, uh, uh, there is something oppressive uh, and there is uh, very much uh, politics in this, right? Politics of conquest uh, associated with it. So, all these things cannot be completely divorced from uh, the uh, from the meaning that uh, these ideas uh, tend to convey even the, in the present time so uh, that uh, that historical scaffolding of these ideas which uh, we tend to believe as universal ideas of liberty individualism uh, progress uh, a republic a citizenship uh, human rights and so forth uh, were actually uh, thrust upon by the use of force, right? You you can't uh, uh, you can't uh, take the narrative of uh, colonization uh, away from the process by which the supposed diffusion of these enlightenment ideas happened uh, to uh, to uh, several parts of the globe. So uh, that's what is being uh, highlighted here in the global history perspective that enlightenment ideas need to be understood as a response to cross border interaction and global integration. So, there is that global integration also happening, right? And uh, it is as a consequence of this cognition that uh, Europe is also having of uh, the world beyond Europe, right? So, uh, this is this is something that can uh, revealed in, in several uh, domains of knowledge creation. You can see it uh, the, the way they are compiling the biotic uh, uh, reservoir of uh, the colonies, the way they are mapping it in the cartographic uh, progress 
uh, of uh, the planet. So, uh, that is that's very much visible. So, uh, the elements that they derived from the uh, colonies or other parts of the globe that they tended to uh, engage with uh, in a in a not a very uh, 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 there was uh, definitely a power asymmetry over there right and uh, this understanding of enlightenment and its ideas uh, are a consequence of that asymmetrical uh, uh, power equation with which uh, europe was engaging uh, with the other parts of the globe so that's the idea uh, that's get conveyed uh, in in uh, in the uh, global history perspective of enlightenment third that enlightenment didn't end with romanticism right uh, it rather continued uh, across the 19th century generally i mean in our conventional textbookish understanding of enlightenment ideas we tend to close it by the middle of the 18th century Right, so uh, the big guns of enlightenment, be it Rousseau, uh, Hobbes, or uh, uh, several others, Montesquieu, uh, and so forth, uh, they were gone, and uh, their writings uh, continued to enlighten us um, over centuries. Uh, but uh, enlightenment period had ended, so that's that's the conventional, uh, or uh, you can say, uh, uh, traditional uh, way in which we tend to understand enlightenment. But the global history perspective emphasizes that it continued across the 19th century and even beyond into the uh, 20th century as well. And uh, it was not only energized by the Parisian philosophies, uh, rather that that elite, uh, you know, culture of, uh, you know, some uh, people sitting and uh, exchanging ideas with each other through their writings through their uh, uh, creation of a different kind of a public sphere that was also simultaneously being uh, being created uh, and uh, creating the possibility of attainment of uh, these ideas and so forth rather uh, uh, rather than uh, getting created like this uh, the enlightenment ideas resulted as a consequence of the historical actors around the world and when we say around the world we are not fixated with the uh, with the western europe as such so it was happening in cairo it was happening at calcutta it was happening in shanghai so there were people who are uh, not necessarily uh, you know uh, only responding to these ideas but they are uh, on their own uh, creating some kind of uh, ideas which is intermingling of course with uh, the uh, renaissance ideas and uh, or uh, with the enlightenment ideas and it is th it is that byproduct of this interaction this connectedness of the world uh, that these ideas emerge and take shape and the way we know about it is a consequence of these mediations, very active mediations, not uh, necessarily passive ones. Uh, so, uh, these people uh, at different locations outside uh, Europe are the ones who invoked the term and what they saw as its most important claims over uh, uh, most important claims for their own specific uh, purposes and uh, again I will give you uh, one example and that will become more clear. So, what we see in this global history perspective is that there is a distinct emphasis on a malleable conceptualization of, uh, uh, of uh, enlightenment which is more conjunctural and context specific rather than uh, some immutable authoritative definition of the enlightenment right so it's it's not a thing it's not a substance uh, that that got created uh, at one point of time in some part of history and gradually it it uh, uh, you know it uh, disseminated to other parts rather it was created it was stretched the meaning was stretched malleable is something that can be uh, you know, beaten to uh, uh, thin sheets, uh, its uh, size can expand and so forth, its scope can expand. So, uh, so that kind of uh, uh, possibility of change in the meaning and substance of enlightenment ideas was always open. Uh, 
uh, with respect to its travel uh, across the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, and in this connection, as a sort of example, I'll cite the case of an allegory by the Japanese artist uh, Shosai Ikei. Uh, and his, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, his uh, uh, paintings, his, his portrayal uh, uh, in, in a woodblock, uh, woodblock uh, print, uh, which is titled Mirror of the Rise and Fall of Enlightenment and Tradition. This was uh, in 1872. So, uh, of course, we have the advantage of hindsight. We are talking of something which was uh, at least 100, 150 years separated from uh, the writings of these big Enlightenment scholars. But uh, look at the kind of uh, the kind of active agency uh, that uh, uh, Japanese people are uh, are playing uh, with these ideas that supposedly. Uh, we understand as enlightenment ideas and uh, uh, since I referred to you that uh, it all began with uh, Kant's uh, uh, essay uh, in the last quarter of uh, the 18th century itself where he had posed this question what do we mean by uh, enlightenment. So, in this depiction uh, you will find that uh, uh, the new and the old uh, uh, Meiji uh, uh, Japan that is Tokugawa Japan and Meiji uh, Japan they are uh, put together in that painting and uh, in the, that constitutes the backdrop of uh, whatever we are discussing the painting that comes as the backdrop is the is the same painting that I am talking of and in that you will find you know juxtaposition of western umbrella versus Japanese paper parasol. So, western umbrella is civilization is enlightenment ideas and Japanese paper parasol is tradition that was of course vanquished that ended up as vanquished and triumphant uh, uh, triumphant uh, uh, you know symbols are uh, in your uh, screen uh, represented on the uh, on the left that is western umbrella triumphed over Japanese paper parasol chair triumphed over the traditional stool uh, of Japan pen triumphed over the traditional brush that the Japanese used, gas lamp triumphed over the traditional candle that the uh, Japanese used, short hair triumphed over uh, the traditional way in which uh, Japanese did their hair, uh, that hairstyle and in the center of it, it is all the steam engine which is symbolized as, uh, as uh, uh, the, the icon of progress. Now, uh, Interestingly, the title of this uh, uh, this wood print is Kaika, which uh, simultaneously uh, is understood as enlightenment and civilization in uh, Japanese uh, vocabulary. Uh, but this depiction, uh, now civilization as uh, conventionally understood is like something which will evolve uh, on its own. I mean, for civilization, you do not need to apply force. Uh, cultures over a period of time will transform into civilizations on account of the gradual evolutionary process and that is how enlightenment ideas were initially projected. But fact of the matter is that this depiction tells you the actual history of, uh, of uh, the reception of these ideas. So, it is this depiction is not a quasi natural development as was suggested by Immanuel, Kla uh, Immanuel Kant rather as a violent battle, as, as a struggle, as a, uh, a victor and the vanquished. Hence, hinting at the use of force, mobilization uh, and not as kind of uh, mankind's exit from its self incurred uh, immaturity. So, similarly, there is a rickshaw depicted uh, against an ox cart, which was the favored mode of Tokugawa, uh, you know, uh, uh, times, uh, the traditional times of uh, Japanese history. And uh, as part of its modernization plan and the uh, Meiji restoration, uh, they, they are uh, representing it uh, as a rickshaw. And it, it is the rickshaw that is trampling over the ox cart. Which, which was a favored mode of trans, uh, transportation um, uh, during the Tokugawa period. Hence, the perception of enlightenment uh, should not be understood as linear and uh, uh, very fixed in terms of what uh, was received uh, as part of the writings of these big enlightenment scholars. Rather, there is fair degree of ambivalence and it is hybrid. 
uh, in, in its composition, in its substance. And it was contingent, its meaning was contingent on several local conditions and power structures. This rickshaw riddle is important because rickshaw did not come from the West. Rickshaw is the ingenuous creation of uh, the Japanese themselves. And they saw and they introduced this uh, as having uh, uh, triumphed over ox cart. So that meaning of, uh, uh, of uh, civilization having triumphed over tradition uh, rides over enlightenment ideas and accords a new meaning to it, which is uh, very much perceived by uh, Japanese in their own uh, cultural uh, sensibilities or in the, in the vocabulary of their own cultural sensibilities. That is what uh, accords hybridity to, to uh, the meanings conveyed by the enlightenment ideas. So uh, that is it what I wanted to convey through the global history perspective of the writings around uh, the enlightenment. Thank you.